All right. Welcome to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and lecture number 99 uh, of our series on the Mora Nebuchim. Um, the, um, we're about to read chapter 16 in book three of the Mora Nebuchim in the Shlomo Pines edition. It is page 461. Uh, chapter 16, that's where we're up to. We just uh, studied um, in 15 the idea that God cannot do the impossible. Uh, we had a very fun, spirited discussion last time about that subject. And the Ramam is about to discuss a subject which um, has been looming throughout our entire class, something that all of you questions have popped up on and off about what he feels about the, the issue. And um, he's about to dive into it finally. And I'm sure that you will enjoy what he has to say and you will find it. Many of you might find it very surprising um, that the Rambam will take the positions that he does regarding the issue of what is known in English as providence and what is known in Hebrew usually described as hashgacha. The idea, the general translation, before we even begin Ramam chapter 16, um, uh, in, in Parak 3, um, is, is uh, the, 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 the simple idea of providence is the idea that God uh, is in control of the minutia of our lives. That would be the most, uh, the idea of hashkacha pratis, the idea that God is in control of everything that happens. The idea that God controls everything that happens to us, to me, to you, to us on a small level, on a large level, right? There's hashkacha pratis, there's hashkacha klalis, the idea that God is, is in control of all of the big things that happen. Um, and then the idea that often extends beyond that in control of every little thing that happens, the, every leaf that falls, every grass that blade that grows, and so on and so forth. That is the idea that many of us are accustomed to hearing and accustomed to thinking that is a, a foundation of, uh, or at least one of the ideas that's often put forward as a foundational idea in, in Judaism. Ramam does not take that approach at all. And his idea of providence is extremely different. And it might be new to a lot of those of you that aren't familiar with Ramam's thought. And uh, for you, it'll be, and for all of us, it'll be extremely exciting to listen and hear this. Um, and and I'm going to warn you that there's several chapters where there's no way we're going to finish this subject this week, but we're going to get into it. We're going to dive in and we're going to see all kinds of interesting things and hopefully stimulate interesting thoughts and discussion. Um, and the more surprising it is to you, then the more you're obviously understanding what the Ramam is actually saying. Before I do this, I, I want to say something that's not directly relevant to the Ramam. It's kind of something personal. And it's kind of, I, I guess you can call it a pet peeve of mine. But, um, but it's the reason why I teach this class the way I do. And it's the reason why whenever I am privileged to have the opportunity to teach, I choose the route that I take. So it's a little bit personal. And it comes from some of the great teachers that I've had in my past, uh, um, most notably my father and many of the things that he taught, he has teaches and taught me and teaches me to this day. And and my Rosh Hashiva of, um, uh, and, and Neri Yisrael, who, who's, um, who, uh, from whom I learned so much and that's uh, uh, or of Kolevsky or of Yaakov Kolevsky and others that taught me the value and importance of reading and understanding the text of the of that that that's in front of us. In other words, reading and understanding what it is that he who you're trying to learn from is actually teaching you, and not throwing your own thoughts and ideas onto what they're saying, and then reading what you want to see. So, as opposed to reading what you want to see, reading what's actually there. This lesson is something that was kind of banged into my head. And one thing I remember when my father used to listen to uh, 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 tapes of the Klosenberger Rebbe, uh, who used to teach the Parsha. One of the close, close, every once in a while, the Klosenberger Rebbe used to go off in Yiddish on a, on, a, on a rant about how people think they're learning Torah and they're not learning Torah. 
They're learning what so-and-so says, what this guy has a speech to give about, what that guy says. If you're learning Torah, open the page, open the Gemara and read it. Then you're learning Torah. Everything else you're doing, that's not Torah. And I must say that the overwhelming majority of Torah lectures, and I put Torah in quotes, that I hear, and I'm calling left, right, up, down, not this this group, that group, all over the place. You go onto the internet, there's hundreds of thousands of lectures by now of people that teach supposedly Torah subjects, but they're not actually teaching Torah. They're teaching what they think in their mind is what the Torah says, and then they give you a lecture, and they might quote a few things here and there to support what they're trying to say. I'm going to tell you, and this is almost almost a, a vow on my on my part, that if I'm going to teach anything to anyone, I'm going to open the Rambam and tell you what the Rambam says. I'm going to open the Navi and tell you what the Navi says. I'm going to open the Gemara and tell you what the Gemara says. Of course, there will be times that I'm going to say, this is how I understand it. This is how I interpret it. That's fair. That's okay. But the point is to learn what the Rambam says. And I've really tried faithfully to do this over the last 98 lectures, and I believe Netter will continue to try to do this for the rest of the time. It is crucial and important to allow ourselves to listen to what the Rambam has to say and absorb it. We could like it. We could not like it. We could argue with it. We could debate it. But when we're learning the Rambam, we have to learn what the Rambam actually says, what the text actually says. I think it is the biggest disservice that a rabbi can ever do to get up and teach Torah without actually speaking words of Torah. If anyone gets up, unless they tell you, this is my opinion, this is what I think, fine. Everyone has the right to say what they think. And if you're interested, as long as you know that it's what they think. But if someone is speaking in the name of the Torah, they should be opening up the Torah, reading it, and and and, and communicating it that way. I, this is a, it's a, it's it's a it's a I don't know a pet peeve of mine. But I I, I can't even the, the amount of times I've heard people speak in the name of Torah when they're actually speaking nonsense is just too innumerable for me to go through. So thank you for allowing me to go on that slight. Um, little uh, off ramp there but I, i'm now i'm going to focus now on trying to understand what ramam is trying to teach us in ch chapter 16 and um and, and and let's see what he has to say so here we go an aberrant opinion is professed by the philosophers concerning god may he be exalted with respect to his knowledge of what is other than he so there's an opinion the ramam says that the philosophers state and it's going to be regarding the subject of providence right does, so providence requires several things. The idea of providence is that A, God knows what's going on, right? And B, that not only does he know what's going on in this world, that he knows the details of what's going on, and he does things to control it, right? So, so in other words, he's, he pays attention and he's in constant control over the things that are happening. That's the idea of providence. Now, um, so there's an aberrant opinion among the philosophers uh, and they have stumbled in such a way that they ne that neither they nor those who follow them with regard to this opinion can find absolution. And they have made a mess of this whole idea in such a way that uh, people that, that the philosophers themselves and people that try to read and understand them get, they, there's no way for that out of this mess that they've created for themselves with this opinion. I shall let you hear the difficulties. First, I'm going to tell you, how do they get to this opinion? And the Ram is going to lay out some of the most basic questions of theodicy right now, basic questions of how it is that God runs the world and why people could make certain conclusions that can be, um, that can be wrong. And eventually, uh, I doubt we'll get there tonight, but eventually Ramam is going to present to us what he feels is the true way, uh, uh, the answer to these questions. Uh, does God know what's going on? Number one, and if He does, does He does He care? And does He um, does He do anything? Does He control what's happening? Does God control what happens in our day to day life? I should also let you hear the opinion of our Torah. When remember, when He uses the word law, the translation is Torah about this and our opposition to them in regard to their evil and incongruous opinions concerning God's knowledge. The philosophers, because of their thought process. Now, remember, Rambam is a philosopher himself, right? And he's going to tell us how, you know, he, these questions don't necessarily need to lead to the conclusions that these philosophers have. 
So let's read chapter 16 and see what these problems are. What are the problems? What are the issues that the philosophers had to deal with? That which in the first place was mainly responsible for plunging, that for those that recently joined, we're on page 461, chapter 16. That's in the this version, the Shlomo Penis edition of the, um, of the Guide of the Perplexed. That which in the first place was mainly responsible for plunging them into and impelling them toward this opinion. Remember, he didn't yet tell us what this opinion is. He's telling us how, what is it that pushed them into this opinion is what appears at first sight to be a lack of order in the circumstances of the human individuals. And the fact that the Adam, among the Adamites, some excellent individuals are in a sorry and grievous plight, whereas some wicked individuals are in good and pleasurable circumstances. In other words, the basic question of the Odyssey, why is it that when we look at the world that we see, we don't see the type of justice that we expect to see, right? We would expect to see in a just world, a world in which good people are living a good life and doing well, and bad people are suffering for being bad. That's what we would expect to see. So they looked at what, uh, what the Ramam said, the Adamites, you know, all human beings, and that's not what we see. We see awful people living in big, beautiful houses and swimming pools and, and driving Rolls Royces. And we see really, really good people that are struggling to make ends meet and are suffering from illnesses and all kinds of terrible suffering. So, so, so the philosophers looked at a world like this and they thought to themselves, how, how, what do we do? This impelled them to formulate the division that you will now hear. Because of this observation, they were forced, they were pushed to, um, to ma make the following uh, thing, uh, make the following uh, 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 steps of logic. They said, one of two things must be true, right? There has to be one of the following things. God, this is with the assumption that God exists. Right. Remember, Rambam established already that God exists, you know, in with if, with with through logic, through his proofs. So and and the, that and that time that wasn't really the question, right? The issue, you know, the fact that there was a God was an Aristotelian science. That was the way it was understood, right? So number one, if but today you would have to say, let's assume, okay, you can make an atheist argument that God doesn't exist. That would be argument A. But let's put that aside for a minute. But if you say there is a God, then you'd make one of the two things must be true. God either knows nothing about these individual circumstances and does not comprehend them. Either he knows what's going on. He knows that that, that person who's a, who's a terrible liar, thief, uh, a violent, uh, a cruel human being who's living the good life, right? Right? And that person who's a honest, humble wonderful, kind person who's suffering terribly, and God just doesn't know, right? He doesn't know. That's one possibility. Or he knows and apprehends them, or he knows them. This is a necessary division. There's only two choices. Either he knows what's going on, or he doesn't know what's going on. Okay, so let's think this through, right? Um, this is uh, Thereupon they said, okay, if he apprehends them, right, and knows them, so let's assume for a moment the idea that God does know. So he knows what's going on. He sees that our world is a world of, 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 of what seems to us to be injustice. It's not right. It doesn't work that Why Why is it this way? Why did that guy who's such a blank, 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 blank get the job when I deserve to get it and I'm sitting here struggling and, 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 and I can't get that job? Why? Why, does, why is it that way? So there's, there, there's one of three things must be true. Either Either, number one, he orders them, settling them according to the best, the most perfect, and the most accomplished order, right? Right? If God knows what's going on in the world, there's three possibilities. Either he knows and he controls them, and he does it in the best possible way, right? Let's leave aside for the moment that what it doesn't appear to us to be good. But if God knows what's happening on this world, either he does something and he sets up the best possible, most just, pop, proper world. That's possibility number one. Or he is incapable of establishing order in them. There's no power over them. He knows, but he has no power over it. God knows, but but whether he would like to make it more just or not doesn't matter because he can't, right? He's up there sitting in heaven. He has no control, right? He can't do anything about it. Or again, he knows, or possibility number three, he knows and he can, he's able, I just turned to page 462, to establish excellent order in the government, but neglects to do so. 
right? But he doesn't want to. He says, heck with them, right? Uh, neglects to do so in consequence of his disdain and contempt or in consequence of his jealousy. He's a jealous God, right? He, he, he He's not interested because he doesn't care, right? He's not interested because... Because um, you know, the, here jealousy is 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 meant to be like it's a complete lack of concern, his disdain and contempt. Who cares about those little measly human beings down there? They're just a bunch of nothing. They're a bunch of piles of dirt. I don't really care about them. I'm he, I'm God. I'm great. I'm wonderful. I'm perfect. I don't need these characters. I don't care about them. So he's suffering. So he's doing good. Who cares, right? So. Just as we find among human beings, a man who is able to procure, but we find people doing that. We find a lot of people, you go to a person who has the capability, he has the wherewithal, he has the resources to help, right? Another individual, he's aware of the latter's need. He knows that someone else is suffering. He knows he can write him a check, pay his doctor bill, give him, a, give him the food that he needs, fix his roof, whatever it is the person needs. Right, but out of his ill nature, his wickedness, he's miserly, he's stingy, he's just a bad person, and his jealousy begrudges him this benefit and hence does not procure it. He doesn't take the time to write the check and help the guy out or take the extra five minutes to give him a sandwich. He just doesn't do it because he doesn't care. Right? So, so um, so this division is likewise necessary and correct. So those three options are clearly true. So, number one, either God knows what's going on in this world or he doesn't know what's going on in this world. If he knows what's going on in this world, one of three things is possible. Either it's he does control it and makes sure everything is good, or he can't control it, or he can, could control it, but doesn't, right? Those are the three possibilities. If you can think of any others, let me know, right? I mean to say that everyone who knows a certain matter must, if I happen to know something, like I know that uh, that the su the the football game tomorrow is going to be between uh, whatever team A and team B, right? Between the Ravens and the Browns. I know that that's what's going to happen tomorrow. I know, right? But either either I have control over it, right, right, and I could make the Ravens win, right? I happen to be a Ravens fan, being originally from Baltimore. Okay, so or I don't have control over it, right? In other words, I could want the Ravens to win. But I have no control over who's going to win tomorrow. They're going to play the game tomorrow. And whoever's going to, I mean, the quarterbacks might have some control. The, all the players, the coaches, they might have a little bit of control. But I have zero control over who wins the game tomorrow, right? The third possibility is that I don't care. I'm not going to watch the game. I'd rather, I'd rather go visit my friend, right? I don't care. There's three possibilities, right? So either I can control it or I can't control it. Or I could control it, but I don't care, right? Those are the three possibilities. Uh, neglects the governance. To, uh, so, so, uh, so his example is interesting. It's funny uh, if you just saw my cat walking behind, or she's still walking behind me. Um, the Ramam is about to mention cats. So, um, uh, is a man, for instance, neglects the governance of the cats in his house, right? In the Ramam's day, people had cats wandering all over their houses. You know, they were very useful to keep the uh, the rodents under check, right? But, no, but nobody paid attention to them. The cats were kind of like a background noise, right? I know they're there, but whatever. I don't, I don't, I don't really pay attention to it, right? Or even of more contemptible things or, you know, or other things. You know, that, uh, again, sometimes he who exercises care with regard to some matter may, he be, may be incapable of government, though willing to do so. Sometimes you might care a lot about a certain thing. You might care very much about something. I really, really, really want this such and such a thing to happen, but I have no control. I want that job. I really need that job. I'm going to do everything I can to get it. But the bottom line is I can't control whether or not I get hired for that job. It's just not in my control, right? If you could give me control, I would love to. I'd love to be able to control what the lottery tickets numbers tomorrow are going to be, but I can't, I don't have it, right? I'm willing to control it, but I can't. After they established this division, they decided, so then, so now the philosophers thought through these three options, okay? Uh, categorically, two of the three cases, one of which must necessarily be valid with regard to everyone that knows, one of the three must be true. So they said two of them are impossible with respect to God. Two can't possibly be true. Namely, the case in which you would have no power, that can't be. God is God. How could it be that God has no power to control things? I can't accept that. This is what the philosophers are saying. 
if God can create a world, remember this is Ramam at this point, he's under, I think he's under the assumption that they're not the God of Aristotle, who was not the creator, but the God of Maimonides, who is a creator, right? Well, if he creates the world, he must have the ability, right? If God is all powerful, all knowing, yada, yada. So, so he must have the ability to do something. So I can't accept that he can't, right? Like, so, or in the case which he would have the power, but not care, right? I can't accept that either. That would be a difficult thing to accept, that God could do something to help me, but he doesn't because he doesn't care. Ooh, that's tough, right? So they didn't want to accept either one. For this would create in him evil or incapacity. That would make God evil, right? Right, and we don't we don't believe in an evil God. We're not taught in the Torah about an evil God. No one wants to accept an evil God. We want to assume that God is is a good God, right? So they don't want to accept those two possibilities. I mean, there might be some religions in which they have gods that are evil, but not not ours, not our monotheistic religion. He is exalted above these two things. He can't be incapable or evil, and and evil and and being completely not caring at all, not being concerned is basically the same thing. Thus, in the whole division, only the following cases remain. So now I'm left with, right? God is a good God, right? God is, is, is right? So is capable of, of interfering. So now I'm left going back to the first the two questions, the first two possibilities. Either he knows nothing at all of the circumstances or he knows them and establishes them in the most excellent order. So it must be, that God, either either he's a good God and he's capable and everything, but he just doesn't know. And that's why we see this seeming injustice in front of us. That's why we see evil people being prospering and good people not doing well, right? Because God doesn't know. He doesn't know. Um, if, if anyone is here is listening as well to my uh, podcast, I just taught chapter 24 in the book of Eov where he addresses this very thing, where Eov in his suffering, right, says, if only I could say that God doesn't know, then at least I'd have a little bit of comfort in knowing, right? That, that you know, I'm suffering and, I, and, and, and when I look at God, I can't ask him why. I can't ask him why I'm suffering so much because God just doesn't know. But the bottom line Eob says is that I know that God does know. That makes it even harder to suffer, right? Because I'm suffering and God knows about it and I'm still suffering, even though I'm an innocent person, Eob said. Um, so, so, but as, uh, so, or, he, or it could, so that's possibility number one, that he doesn't know, or he knows, but establishes them. He knows and he controls it. And everything that he does is the exact way it should be. Okay. Uh, the burning question is now burning much stronger, right? Right. The burning question of, of, of theodicy is burning really hard now. Right. But we at any rate, fine that they are without order. But nonetheless, even though we just said that God makes a perfect world and God has the ability and he has the knowledge and he controls everything, then why do we look at this world and we see a world without any order at all, right? Do not observe analogies and have no continuity as such as they ought to have. Things don't work the way they're supposed to, at least the way we think they're supposed to, right? I could do everything right and still not get the job. I can do everything right and still, God forbid, get cancer. I can do everything right and still, you know, a, a disaster could happen. Someone else could do everything wrong and they still manage to be okay and have everything that they need or even more. Consequently, this is a proof, right? Um, <clears throat> so then, if that's true, then this would seem to prove that he does not know these circumstances in any way or through any cause, whatever. This is what plunged them at first into this very aberrant opinion. So now, right, we, we they're stuck, right? These, these philosophers are stuck into this opinion. If God created a world that's perfect, right, um, how then do we explain, right, this, this dichotomy that we're, that we're struck against? Um, you know, so they insist that God created everything in perfect order, but nonetheless, it's not what we see. You will find that all that I have summarized for you concerning their divisions and the point I made calling attention to the fact that this is where they erred are clearly set forth in Alexander of Aphrodisia's treatise on governance, if you want to see that. Okay. Now, um, so see and marvel, Ramam says, and I'm at the bottom of page 462 now. 
how they plunged into something worse than that which they tried to avoid and how they were ignorant of a matter to which they were constantly drawing our attention and that they were always explaining to us. Okay, what do I mean, Ramam says? As for their plunging into something worse than that which they tried to avoid, it consisted in the fact that in trying to avoid imputing negligence to God, right? In other words, so I, I missed something that I have to go back and emphasize. So the Ramam says their conclusion is, right? I, I need to emphasize the conclusion of the philosophers that is the mistake is that God um, uh, uh, is capable, right, of intervening, right? What he does is good, right? But, right, he doesn't know everything that's going on. Right. That's that was the conclusion that the philosophers made. Right. He doesn't know. Right. And because he doesn't know, that's why you know, he either doesn't know. In other words, not that he doesn't pay attention, but he's not capable of knowing everything that's going on. That's the mistake that the Rama is saying these philosophers made. Now, the problem is that he's saying now, if that's your conclusion, then you've just made a worse problem. Why? Because what they were trying to avoid, it consists in the fact that in trying to avoid imputing negligence to God, they didn't want to say that God is negligent. They didn't want to say that God knows, but he doesn't care, right? So instead, they said he doesn't know. But they made it worse. They decided that he is ignorant and that everything in this lowly world is hidden from him and he does not apprehend it. So instead of making him negligent, they made him ignorant, right? As for their being ignorant of that to which they were constantly drawing our attention, right? It consists in their considering what exists from the point of view of the circumstances of human individuals, right? Because they, the fact that they, right, were ignorant to that which they were constantly drawing attention. In other words, they're constantly drawing attention to the fact that we don't see justice in this world, which led them to conclude that God doesn't know what's happening, right? They, the problem is, is that when they're considering what exists, they're considering what exists from the point of view of the circumstances of human individuals. They're looking at me and you and themselves from their point of view, what they see, right, is, is, um, is injustice, is wrong, right? And from the point of view of each, indi each human individual, if that's how you look at everything, if that's how you interpret the entire world, if that's how you interpret all of existence, then it doesn't make sense. So you must say that God doesn't know. But the evils befalling the latter, and I'm warning you now that Ramam is going to make a lot of points. No one point is going to sum up his entire opinion about the idea of theodicy. We have to gather together all of these chapters. But listen anyway to what he says, because each point has, has value and, and builds on the next one. So um, we have already, or builds on the last one, I'm sorry. We have already made clear what was necessary regarding this, Right. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped a sentence. But the evils befalling the latter derive from them or from the necessity of the nature of matter. When things happen to people, it's not happening because God said so, right? Or God said it has to be that way. It happens because, right, of the bad decisions that the people make. We've discussed this before, right? Which the Ramam says here, right? If you look back in chapter 12, right? When people make people have are made of matter, which lead them to make decisions, right, which are selfish, which are only to satisfy those material needs, right? People um, make decisions, right, that 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 are selfish and that cause suffering to themselves and to others because of those selfish needs and those selfish desires, without allowing their active intellect and without allowing their uh, their you know, their, their, their intellectual capacity to purify themselves in, 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 and bring form over matter. Those were the Ramam's Aristotelian language that he used, right? To bring the human form and perfection to their actions. Rather, they would go after their matter. Those things lead to, remember Rama mentioned, you know, nature has its ways, has its course. And through our knowledge, through our wisdom, through our intelligence, we can work our way past that. These evils occur because of the nature of matter, the nature of us being part of the natural world and doing things and acting in such ways that bring these things about. We have already made clear what was necessary regarding this. After having established the foundation that destroys every good foundation and, 
and deforms the beauty of every correct opinion, right? They try to eliminate its disgracefulness through thinking that the knowledge of these things is impossible for the deity for various reasons, right? After ha having established the foundation, in other words, that God doesn't know, right? They decided, these, these philosophers decided that God doesn't know what's going on. By thinking, right? Um, they, 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 they try to cover it up by saying it's impossible for God to know because God is so lofty and high, he doesn't know the things that are going on with us measly little people, right? He can't possibly know. One of them is as follows. Particular things are apprehended by means of the senses only and not by the intellect. But God does not apprehend by means of a sense, right? So you and I could smell something outside. That's a sense. That's Remember, Raman described that as imaginative faculty. We have the sense to smell something. How could God smell something? God doesn't have a nose. He doesn't have a sense of smell. This is the philosophers continuing with their things. So the, the experiences that you and I are having including the experience of pain on one side or the experience of pleasure on the other side are things that God can't possibly know because God is God. How can he know such things, right? In other words, this is the philosophers carrying the lot. Why is it that God doesn't know? Because he can't know. This is the philosophers continuing with that mode of thought. Another one is as follows. Particular things are infinite, whereas knowledge consists in comprehending, right? Things are infinite. Remember, um, in Aristotelian world, right? The world is infinite, right? The world always has been and always will be exactly the way it is, right? So that's an, that's infinite. But knowledge is of a, of a real concept. God, though, is infinite. How could God know something that's not infinite? It doesn't make sense, right? But what is infinite cannot comprehend it through knowledge. You and I can't comprehend infinity. It's a concept that we can't compute. That's why we call it infinite, right? So, um, uh, so that, so again, that's something that God can't do. So these are the philosophers making logical conclusions. God doesn't know why. A, because he doesn't have senses like you and I have. B, because God is infinite and he can't comprehend things that are not infinite, right? Uh, um, again, another one is as follows. The knowledge of things being produced in time, right? You and I know. I, I know things based on where they fit in time, right? So, so, um, so, um, I, my cat just knocked a whole bunch of figs off my, uh, <laughs> now she's running around the house chasing a fig, but whatever. Anyway, so, 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 um, I don't know where I'm going to find that thing in the end. The, so, so we, we think of things based on how they're produced, right? In time, everything in our mind has, has time segments stamped on it, right? Um, it would necessitate some change in him. If God were to comprehend things that happen in time, he would know today I drove to the gas station tomorrow. I went to the supermarket. If God knew these things, he'd have to have divisions. He'd have to be thinking about today and tomorrow. What did Saul do today? What did Saul do? What's he did, what did he do tomorrow? And so on and so forth, right? Uh, so, so that would be change in God. It involves a renewal of knowledge of after knowledge. So because we, the community, okay, so these are all things that, um, that the, the philosophers said in order to back up their opinion, right, which they stated that God doesn't know what's going on in the world with here. Right. And therefore, that's why uh, it, because they wanted to avoid the philosophical problem of stating that God knows, but either doesn't care or can't change things or 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 is just plain out evil or any of those kind of conclusions. They therefore said that God just doesn't know. Um, and and the, those are the logic behind the proving why it could be that, why it is that God doesn't know. I'm up to the word. It's kind of smack in the middle of the first paragraph on 463, because we. So now the Ramam pivots. This probably should be another paragraph. The community of those who adhere to the law, right? However, us, who the community of people who keep the who adhere to the Torah, right, claim that he had known them before they came about, right? We claim, right, that God knows things and even knows the future, right? So if we're going to claim that God knows the future, so they charge us with two disgraceful opinions. Those philosophers look at us. Those that claim that God knows, right, knows us, knows what's happening, and even knows what's going to happen, right? So, so they'll tell us there's two problems with you guys. First of all, right, um, that science can be attached to pure non-being, and I'll get to that in a minute. And second, that the knowledge of a thing being in potentia and if it's being in active is one and the same thing, right? They'll tell us that, in other words, 
that knowledge can be attached to something that doesn't exist, right? Which in their mind makes no scientific sense. In other words, you can't know the future if the future doesn't exist yet, right? Knowledge, by definition, according to these philosophers, means right that 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 you're comprehending something that exists. If it doesn't exist in in, in my kitchen, it, it could exist in my mind, but it exists somewhere. But something that's in the future can't possibly exist. And once I conjure it up in my mind, it's not a future anymore. It's present. It's in my mind, right? So um, that's number one. So in other words, they say, how could God possibly know the future if the future doesn't exist? It makes no sense. And number two, right, um, uh, knowledge of something is potential, right? And knowledge of something that's actually happening are one and the same thing, right? Because if God knows something that's going to be in the future, right, then it's going to be in the future. So then it's the same as it being happening. And that doesn't make sense, right? Potential is different from actual, right? So, um, so their thoughts were sometimes opposed to one another. Some of them said that he knows only the speed. So, so therefore, so and and the um, philosophers went through a whole bunch of other mental gymnastics, right? As follows: some of them said that he only knows only the species and not the. So, so they didn't want to say that he doesn't know anything. So, some of them said, well, he doesn't know the details of what's going on with each individual, but he knows the species. God knows what human beings do. He knows what cats do. He knows what trees do. He knows, you know, what rocks do, right? But he doesn't really know, right, what, what I do and what you do, what Ruvain does, what Shimon does, what, what Joe Schmo does, right? But he knows how human beings work. He knows how human beings live. He knows the kinds of things that human beings like, what they don't like, what they do, and how they make their decisions. Some of them claimed that. Others claimed he knows nothing at all inside, outside himself. All he knows is himself. So that according to this opinion, there's no multiplicity of cognitions there, right? God doesn't know a lot of different things, so they don't have to worry about there being more than one division within God, right? There are also some philosophers who believe, as we do, that he, may he be exalted, knows everything, and nothing at secret is at all hidden from him. There are those great men prior in time to Aristotle who are also mentioned by Alexander in that treatise, but he rejects their opinion, saying that, but, but Alexander rejects the opinion of those who agree with us. Right, he rejects the Torah opinion by stating it's refuted by the fact that we see that good men are attained by evils and evil men obtain the good things. They use theodicy to disprove the idea that God could know everything. So, in other words, they the bottom line of all of this is the philosophers that the Rambam are quoting danced around with playing with the idea of what does God know, right? They couldn't handle the fact if if God knows everything. And they couldn't take a candle the fact that it, the world exists the way we see it, right? That the evil people prosper and good people don't, right? Because they couldn't handle that, the way they answered it was by some form of stating that God really doesn't know everything, right? To sum up, right? It has become clear to you that all of them, if they had found that the circumstances of the human individuals are well-ordered, let's say these, let's say tomorrow you woke up and you walked outside, and every person who, who is charitable, who is humble, who is honest, who is decent, right, all of a sudden got a nice car and a nice family, and they were cured of all their diseases, and they had a nice paycheck every week, and, and everything was cool. And all of those nasty people out there, all of a sudden they uh, lost their jobs and got sick and so on, right? Everything was perfectly ordered. Right, if you went out of the world where every justice was a hundred percent perfect according to our minds in this hypothetical uh, world, right? Then, according to what appears to as order to the multitude, in other words, Rama points out, according to what you and I think, what the multitude, what people think is the way it should be, would not at all have plunged into this speculation. They wouldn't have said that God doesn't know. They would have said, "Oh yeah, God knows everything." Right? They were pushed into saying that God doesn't know because they looked at a world that doesn't have the kind of justice they expect to see, right? And when you don't see the justice you expect to see, you'd rather say, oh, God just doesn't know, right? What first impelled them towards the speculation was the fact that they considered the circumstances of people, of the wicked and the good, and that in their opinion, these matters were not well-ordered. They looked at the world and they said, wait, it doesn't look to me right. This doesn't look good. In my opinion, it appears to be unjust. The world does not appear to be working the way it's supposed to. 
must be right uh, uh, god doesn't know right um as was said by those among us who are ignorant the way of the lord is not well ordered right um i i should pull up that verse from yecheskel i don't remember the hebrew but um give me one second uh you know, uh, those were the, the people that were complaining, right? Uh, you know, God's ways are just not working out right. They're not proper, right? They were complaining to the prophet in that verse. Um, after I have explained that the discussion concerning knowledge and that discerning providence are connected. So so I described this to you, Ramam says, because, because when, I, when I talk about the knowledge of God, and we're going to see soon in upcoming chapters, our knowledge of God, in other words, the knowledge both ways, is very closely connected and intertwined with the idea of providence, right? You can own what when any discussion of what knowledge God has of us and what knowledge we have of God is going to be closely intertwined with a discussion of how much control does God exert over us and conversely, how much control we do or don't have over God, right? In other words, do our actions affect God, right? So we can only have that discussion once we recognize that we know God or can know God or can't know God, depending on how you look at it, we're going to discuss that, or how much does God know us, right? How much can God know? Can God know us? Remember those philosophers gave some somewhat convincing arguments that maybe God can't know us. So knowledge and providence are very closely intertwined ideas. And we can only discuss those ideas, right, if we understand how closely intertwined they are. So now that I told you how closely intertwined they are, I shall begin to explain the opinions of those engaged in speculation concerning providence. Now I'm going to go through the various different opinions. I touched on them last paragraph just a few minutes ago, right, Ramam says. But I'm going to go through in more detail the various opinions towards what kind of providence God has over that what's going on in this world. After that, I shall begin to resolve the doubts expressed with regard to the deity's knowledge of particular things. And once I talk about the different types of providence, I'm going to go back to talk again about how much knowledge God has of particular things in this world, right? Does he know that the, that the leaf, uh, you know, in the middle of the forest uh, in a mile away from my house fell on Tuesday? Does he know? Does he care? Right. Or, how, or does, he, does he know big things? Does he know about uh, who's going to win the presidential election? I, mean, I don't know, or, or what we think are big things. So these, this is, this is Ramam introducing us to this very, very and closely intertwined and extremely important religious idea of knowledge and providence. Um, there's no way, chapter 17 is going to take us probably more than a week, um, probably two solid lectures. And I'm probably going to take the first uh, next week, I'm going to go through the uh, first four opinions of providence that Rambam rejects. One of which is going to sound awfully close to what many of you might be thinking is the Jewish opinion on providence. Right. And then the fifth one, which is the Rambam's own opinion on providence and how it works. But when Rambam lays out his opinion on what providence is, right, he is then going to go through several more chapters of, of uh, supporting his idea and 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 um, and uh, refining his idea. So we have a lot of work to go on doing this. But but for now, remember the following points: the connection between knowledge and providence, right? The various ways, the the, the various possibilities for providence. In other words, maybe God uh, doesn't know. Maybe God knows and doesn't care. Maybe God knows and cares but can't do anything about it. Maybe God knows. And, and and cares and does everything about it and he controls everything and everything is perfect. But then we're stuck with the big question of theodicy, which is the big black hole. What do we do, right? So these are the possibilities and we're going to play with them and we're going to study them in the upcoming weeks. Um, I'll open the floor to uh, questions, comments uh, now because I think this is a good place to stop uh, because the next one, if I started, we'd, we'd at at five, 10 minutes, we'd start diving into the meat. There's just no way, there's no good stopping point. Um, so, uh, this is Jack, this yes. is Jack Hassan. can you hear me? Yes, I can, so, very well. So, I was reflecting on a lot of what you were saying, and 
I want to just pass this by you to see, and again, we haven't gotten to the to the true meat of what uh, Maimonides meant, but you know, my thought is this, and, and this to me is a possibility that wasn't necessarily mentioned, but hinted at. God, you know, God established the universe and he had certain rules. Mm -hmm. They were based on physics, they were based on science, they were based on order. And he established it in a way that things are reproduced, things are orderly, and the non-human matter or non-human energy really conforms to those patterns. Uh, when oxygen and hydrogen go together, it makes water, and it does it every time, because that's mm -hmm. a natural phenomenon, and it's not a human phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But God also expects that, in a way, the, th the way he put the body in order and put humans in order, uh, he basically set us into motion in a very similar way where there were things that could be altered that we would alter. We have an ability to alter these things ourselves. We can make our own future and do things. And by the way we do things from the beginning of when we were children on, we make subtle alterations in the way we are so that these alterations may alter really a pattern of, perf of a perfect life so that even though we have Torah to go with and guide us, we still are human beings and we may alter it. For instance, our diet, whether we exercise, whether we train our mind, whether mm -hmm. we do other things that might improve our ability not to have bad things happen to us, to be successful and, and so forth. Those people that follow that order statistically, and again, everything, God goes by statistics as far as I'm concerned. And statistically, statistically, if you're doing those things, statistically, you have a chance of having that happen. I don't think that God necessarily wants to interfere with that. God probably did turn it over to us. And if these things happen, it's not like God's going to come in and say, okay, you did this, so I'm going to fix this. God ne doesn't necessarily want to fix it, God gave us a chance. We did that. If we altered it, it is our problem, and we did it. Uh, so that leads to the thing about what about bad people? Right. Well, again, a lot of bad people get away with everything, and there may be reasons beyond what we understand, but many bad people don't get away with things, and they do have problems down the road, even though they may be wealthy, and they may have other problems based on their mm -hmm. behavior that may interfere with their interpersonal relationships, you know, their personality, mm -hmm. other things that make them unhappy, even though you don't know that. So I just would open the floor to that and just see what you think. And how does that apply to what uh, what Maimonides is heading toward? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of the issues that you're bringing up are, are the issues that he's going to be addressing. I mean, you're bringing up extremely good points. Um, the... Um, the question is, uh, in, in Ramam, is going to be a question of balance. You know, how much do we say happens because nature, you know, dictated it so? H how much do we have control over to change as human beings? And how much are we also just part of nature with living by the rules that, you know, that nature dictates? You know, how much suffering uh, comes upon us because of our own, you know, problems that we can't really blame on God, you know? Uh, how, and how much um, and how much does God intervene to do things as opposed to the general uh, idea that, I mean, God created the world. The, the world is going around because God made it happen this way. But but does he directly direct the, the, those things to happen? Um, I mean, the, the questions that you and, and issues that you raise are, are really and, and, and how Ramam is going to balance these things is is going to in other words, how much of it is us? is you and I, how much yeah. of it is nature, right? In other words, it's not you or I, no one can control. It's just, that's the way nature is. And it's controlled only by the fact that God created nature the way he did. You know, he set the universe in motion with the laws of nature that, that, that rule the universe and how much of it is God intervening and making X, Y, Z happen. Right. And th these are the three questions and how you balance those is, is, is when you read through the, uh, philosophers in general, but I'm specifically going to focus a moment on Jewish philosophers, the way you balance those three, uh, you know, me and you versus uh, nature versus God um, is really, it's fundamental to how you understand, you know, our relationship with God, our purpose in this world, 
and and just just what what a Jewish philosophy in general. Ramam is going to take, and, and you know this won't surprise you. Ramam is going to take an, a, a position which leaves very little um, to um, for 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 uh, role for God in 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 this thing in the sense of God messing around with you know you know making this and this happen you know there's going to be a much smaller role in, in that the the but but I'm giving away uh, what we're going to study together yeah, <laughs> so I don't, yeah, want to don't, do it don't give it away yeah yeah but, it's it's a much yeah. it's going to be a much larger role for the rules of laws of nature the way God set it in motion and and and, and that's the way that God intervenes but 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 there is going to be a role for us to choose but it's not necessarily going to be what you, what some people might think, right? The choose to do good versus bad. It's going to be a different role, and and I, I don't want to give that away. But but there is a place where you and I can connect to God and get more, and get more of that relationship, and get more of that providence, Ramam style providence, right? And it's not going to be through through the choices we make in our actions, but it's going to be in 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 our in our intellect. And in our in our work on ourselves, but but I, I just jumped way ahead. But but um, but but these are really the fundamental questions, and 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 Ramam is is a way to deal with them, and it's an important way for us to learn, whether we like it or not, or whether we want to follow some of the other approaches is is totally open. But 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 it's extremely important. I, I hope I addressed what you said because you had you a lot did. of. I mean, basically, points. my thought is that God mostly has hands off. And it's up to us to do those things. And uh, if things happen, it's not because God has willed it that way, but because part of it or most of it is probably related to what we decide to do. Uh, that That's just sort of the way I look at it. Yeah, well, I think you're going to align closer to the Rambam than some other people might, you know. Uh, yeah. But, 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 but. Well, and, when, and, you're based in, when you're based in science, many times you, you parallel what people in science have always believed. So, yeah. 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 Any other comments before we uh, uh, close up for today? We got a couple minutes. If there aren't, that's okay because we have a, a lot of really cool stuff ahead of us. Um, um, uh, and uh, I guess the Yom Tovim are approaching. I should mention, of course, today being nine eleven, um, just the particular solemnity of the day and the importance of today and. Wonder if we ever learned any lessons from what happened on this date. What was it, 13 years ago? Um, but um, I just, uh, in terms of the consequences of human actions. But um, 23. What was that? Sorry. 23 years ago. Sorry. 23. Yeah. Anyway, it's hard to believe that it's been that long. But I just saw. So I wish everyone a wonderful evening, and look forward to Mitzvah next week. Uh, where we'll continue with the next chapter 17 and it's gonna it's gonna be a lot of thinking a lot of hard work but it's very very fruitful um very fruitful to understand how ramam deals with this question of theodicy you know to some degree we, we might be very satisfied some degree we might be very unsatisfied but i, I haven't never had a discussion of this subject that i walked out saying oh got it now <laughs> so <laughs> so um yeah. so, so um It'll it'll be fun. That much I can tell you for sure. So have a, a wonderful evening. Yes, you're cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you're cool.